Thank you very much, and thank you all of you for coming here. Uh, I'll now, uh, within the next uh, like 45 minutes or 40 minutes, something like this, 40 minutes maybe, share uh, with you what is um, uh, motivating me and what a little bit about my design philosophy, and of course, tell about my work with the Patera. Um, so. Um, as uh, Norel already told you, uh, I started out being a musician and when you practice a lot to play an instrument end up in playing in an orchestra, you hear a lot of really good music. But after a while I found out that maybe I had chosen the wrong instrument. Um, you see me here, or actually you don't see me, because I couldn't see you because I had this very heavy instrument between me and the audience. And most of the time, I spend actually counting empty bars, while all the violins, who didn't have to carry that much, they could play the music and the beautiful sound. Uh, and in a way, this was a little bit frustrating for me, um, also because you had to carry this very heavy thing, and then you just end up uh, counting bars. Um, but I um, had the privilege of meeting some very nice and inspiring people. And one of these masters is this guy, Jorah Friedman, who is an um, Israeli-Argentinian uh, clarinetist. And with him, I had the privilege to improvise. Um, and he showed me this image of what is improvisation, which um, made a deep impression of me and which I still have with me today when I do design. So according to Jorah Friedman, when you improvise, what you do is that you you, you ask an angel and ask the angel to give you a melody or a tune. And you get one note, because in one note, everything is in this single note. However, you don't understand this because you're just a human. So you ask the angel, oh, give me another tune. And you get the next tune, and the next note, and the next note. And the combination of all these tunes is what our human ear hears as the melody. So you will always be able to hear that this melody is me that is playing this melody, or Ulla, or Peter, or whoever is playing it. And even though all the notes come from the same angel or whatever you believe in, then I'm not creating anything. I'm not creating the notes. I'm simply asking for it. I'm finding it. And then because I've been practicing for so many years, um, my body uh, will, if I'm good, be able to um, transform the image or the sound I hear to some sound you can also hear. This concept is not a new concept. Michelangelo, he said when he's making a sculpture in stone, then the sculpture has always been inside of this stone. What he did is just removing the stone that shouldn't be there. Or you could also put it another way, if you go to the forest and you pick some flowers, then the flowers, they're not made by you. They have been grown there a long time before you pass by. But you choose to take this flowers and not this flower. And if somebody else would go the same road, he or she would find another flower to pick up. So what we choose to pick up is something that says a lot about our personality, about, about the human I am, you are, and so on. And this is why it's very important for designers never ever to copy other designers. Because we're not cheating the person we are copying, we're cheating ourselves. Because then we can't find the flower only I can find, or only you can find. Um, and but also it shows that we should not be afraid of not finding any ideas because ideas are all over. What we do is simply be open and find it and then find some case only we can find. Well, um, the Danish word for inventing is opfinde. It's made out of two words, op, which means taking something up, and finding, so you're finding something up. The German word is called erfinden, you are refinding it. 
So that's very much according to what I told you about the flowers, about the angel and all this. So what we do, we simply are open, we are curious, and then we train our system so that we can visualize whatever we see and what we're asking for. Um, as already mentioned, one of my main um, uh, sources for inspiration is life. What you see up there is the result of billions of years of evolution. And um, this is an, an, an engineering masterpiece in many ways. If there would have been a better design than this tree, the tree would not be there. Then the other design would have taken its place. As designers, engineers, humans, then we can learn very much by studying nature. Studying the structures uh, and the engineering behind it. So I always try to learn from life and from nature. Not by copying it, but by learning from it. Another very important source of inspiration is failure. Failure is something we should never try to uh, be ashamed of. Of course, sometimes it's not very good if you do a serious failure as a train before. But when you have a failure, then it's very important uh, sorry, yeah, to share your failure and to learn from the failure. Learning and sharing your experience, your failures, your success is something I try to do a lot. My studio in Copenhagen is a one-man studio as most designers in Scandinavia. Actually in Scandinavia, most designers, I think 99% are one-man studios. In Korea, Samsung has employed more designers than we are in entire Denmark. Um, but what we do is that we share our knowledge, our experience by making uh, working uh, shared workspaces. And there, even though some say we are competitors, we try to do each other as good as we can, because in this way we will never ever become competitors. Because you will always look after another flower than you will look after, or I will look after. Um, so this is my studio on a picnic. And I try to do the same thing on a national level, where I have been organizing a lot of Danish designers, young designers, we try to help them to, 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 to uh, become a success. Um, and most important, we try to share knowledge and in this way raise the level of design and make the Danish design brand and level as strong as possible. So that nobody needs to compete, but we simply attract um, the industry from all over the world. Um, some people think that it's important to know what you do. And I don't believe in that. Of course, you need to have a concept of what you do. But as Albert Einstein said, if I know what to do, why should I then do it? Um, so, and, and, and the way of thinking is, I mean, you think about it, we, we think in many different ways. Um, one thing is our mind and our intellect. But our intellect is the result of, well, I'm 41 years of 41 years knowledge. My intuition or, uh, or, or my, my body is a result of billions of years of evolution. So what is more clever, my intellect or my body? Um, when I do this kind of things, then it's, this is a circular paper, which is folded in circles. And out of this paper, I can make all these kind of modules. Or uh, with this, yeah, this is one example. Or out of this paper, I make these models. Um, so by experimenting, by failing, I experience a lot of things. And afterwards, I use my intellect to analyze what it was. Maybe this was a waste of time, but it resulted in this lab a few days later. So by practicing these kind of different things, by doing um, exercises with your body, with uh, your, your, maybe you don't understand it before you do it, but when you did it, then you can start to analyze and then you begin to understand what you actually did. Many people uh, use lots of money in finding the next trend. 
um, but as a designer, as a product designer, I cannot afford to design based on trends. If you have a finger on your pulse, then you will always be behind the heartbeat. And if I start a design process inspired by the current trend magazine, then the design will be on the market maybe two years later, one or two years later. And at that time, the trend is something completely different. Instead, I try again to learn from nature, to learn some of these basic uh, harmonic uh, rules that has been around for billions of years. So maybe it will survive until the next trend will come. And if you as a designer try to design for life and inspired by life, and life, well, this is what you see there. You should have a deep respect for humans, not for target groups. You should always respect life and humans, I would say. What you see here is an animal that is very good in following trends. And for sheep, it is very important, because if the sheep is going outside of the trend, it will be eaten by the wolf very fast. However, none of you are sheep. Um, I think we should navigate after something else. As Henry Ford said, that, well, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. He didn't ask them. He made a car. Um, I believe that we should, never want, uh, we should never ask people what they want. We should give them what they need. Because if we ask people what they want, we get Brexit and Donald Trump. <laughs> And some think this is what we need, but uh, I don't agree in that. So I will show you a few examples of design principles found in nature. This one is what you see in, in a, a sun, uh, sunflower, um, which I used for the patera. I will go more into details with that. Um, or this one is a structure you'll find in, um, in a snow crystal, ice crystal. All these crystals are hexagonal, but you never find two crystals that are equal, which is really fascinating. I used it for this speaker system for uh, Bang & Olufsen. It's a speaker and acoustic dampener. And uh, this shape is one which I used for uh, this lamp, which was one of my first lamps. Have you ever heard this fairy tale about the naked empire? It's by uh, Hans Christian Andersen, who also made the Little Mermaid, which is the national symbol for Denmark. And I hear you have something with mermaids in, in um, Singapore as well, so maybe we have some kind of connection. Um, anyway, this naked empire, he was this uh, empire who thought that he was dressed up in the most beautiful um, dress in the entire, uh, uh, in his uh, country. But he was naked. And nobody dared to tell him, hey, you're naked. Until a small child was laughing at him and said, hey, why are you naked? And everybody was laughing. And he got humili uh, humiliated very much. After this, all wise emperors and kings, they found out, OK, it's not a good idea to, 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 to get this kind of humiliated. Maybe we need some people that can actually tell us what nobody in our um, castle dares to say. So they hired these kind of jesters to come to the court, make, uh, make uh, fun of them, make them laugh, but also tell them what nobody else dares to say. As a designer, I'm a modern jester. I come to the king, who is Bang & Olufsen, or Louis Paulsen, and instead of telling the CEO what he wants to hear, I need to criticize. I need to, to say what I think is good for the client, not what the client wants to hear. So as a designer, we should not please the king. We should help the king. The trend in 2005 for portable laptops was looking like this. The laptop I made looked like this. 
it was winning an Intel design contest. Um, and the trend for speakers, speakers was looking like this in 2012. I came up with this one. Um, so this is just to give an image of, instead of following the trend, instead of following the best-selling product right now, think about, oh, but what is actually, what am I actually doing? And just to give an example, when I was making this speaker, I was asking myself, what is a speaker? A speaker is about music. A speaker is about sound. How does sound look? How does music look? Well, you can't see it. It's invisible. But what we know about music and about sound is that it's actually traveling in circles. Just as if you drop a stone to the water, it's going out in circles. And if you look in, in music history, you find a lot of circles, like this instrument, one of the oldest instruments, it's a circle. Or the first time when we're able to capture sound in a physical way, like the vinyl, it's a circle. Or when it became digital, it's also a circle again. Or Apple, which became one of the most valuable uh, companies in the world. Um, what made them big was iTunes. And the, the Trojan horse for the iTunes was the iPod. They had a circular interaction wheel, which they maybe found here in the classic stereo. So no matter where you find, look, you find circles, circles, and circles. So it was obvious that the first speaker I should make should not be a square, but a circle. And then how to make the circle stand on a floor in a, using as little materials as possible, make it logic, not make it special, make it logic and good. Well, you put three wooden legs on it and you have a speaker system. And the speaker system is also about rhythms. So you see these um, things behind. It's like and you have the the the, the sound and then the, the circles that are going out. So it's always finding a logic and following it. Um, and then also it's not a machine, but it's a furniture. So the other product I will tell you about is the Patera. And that's why we're all here tonight. When I made the speaker, I asked myself, what is the essence of a speaker? Well, that's sound. So when I should make a lamp, what is the essence of a lamp? Of course, it is light. And what is the most essential light source we know? That's the sun. The sun is so essential that it's actually the center of our solar system. Some people think it's the Earth, but I think uh, the Sun is the center of our solar system at least. And everything on our planet is oriented towards the Sun. Any energy source we have is solar energy. Oil is also solar energy. Uh, wind is solar energy. It's temperature differences which becomes the solar energy. And solar energy is of course solar energy. So everything is about the sun. Um, if you talk about light, good light is not having extremely much light or homogenic light. Uh, you also need to talk about shadows. Because shadows is very important to read a person. Just as if you see a movie and the character is only good or only light, then it gets a very boring movie. Um, you need all sides, and shadows are very important to see, just as light are important. When you talk about light and functional light, one of the most important things is to make glare-free light. Because if you get glared, you will get a headache, and actually it will be harder for you to see than if there would be less light. So good light is not always much light. I will also tell you a little bit about how you can use uh, light to actively decorate your home and shape your home simply by the use of light. So the Patera was very much about light and light is not only light, light is also atmosphere. What you see here is a, a fire. Uh, in the old days we used an open stove to heat our home and also to lit our, to, 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 well to light it up. Today, nobody would use an open fire stove to light your home or to warm it. 
But we all know that if we have the possibility to have a fire in our home, at least in Denmark, the value goes very much up because it gets so much atmosphere. Having the nice atmosphere was something Paul Henningsen, a Danish designer and lighting icon, was very much aware of. Um, he wanted his mother to look as beautiful in the, um, as she looks in, in, in the candlelight as she, uh, when we have the electric light bulb. In Denmark, we use candles a lot because it's cozy and because it gives a lot of atmosphere. If you should go out for a date, you would never go out for in, in, in this kind of light. You would always have candles. So in all cafes in Copenhagen, it's full of candles. Um, however, at home, we have these light sources. And Paul Henningsen, he wanted people to look as beautiful in the light of this light bulb as in the candlelight. But the light bulb is giving a lot of glare if there's nothing around it. So he came up with this system of shades uh, that make sure that you never ever, this is the light source, and here are some, some uh, uh, shades, you would never ever be able to see into the light source. So all the light is going from the light source up and then it's bouncing downwards. So his system of uh, working with light is always making light that is bouncing downwards. So you never see the light bulb, you never get the glare, but you get most possible out of the light bulb. Uh, light bulb. Um, here you see a closer detail to his system. I think it was made in the 30s, is that right, Ulla? Yeah, approximately in the 1930s. Um, and it's still the DNA of Louis Paulson. So here you see a light bulb, and here you see his system. Um, and this system is applied to all uh, his lamps. You can see it here, or in this one, or this one. It's always the same system, it's always about avoiding glare, uh, get the comfortable light and get the nice shadows. Um, so this was something about the specific lamps. Now I want to tell you a little bit about how you can use light actively to shape your home and your space. Take a look at this image. Imagine being in this room for, let's say, three hours. Now try to be in this room instead for some hours. Please raise your hand. Who would like to be in this room? And who would like to prefer this room? Okay, I guess more people like to be in this room. What you see here is that here there's one central light bulb and the room gets smaller. In this room, it's the same room, but the light bulb up there is off and behind the curtain, there's not a window, there are some LEDs. They trick your brain and you think that, oh, you're connected to the outside. If something happens, I can easily escape. This is made by a Norwegian lighting designer called uh, Daniel Rybakken. It's a very nice experiment. It shows how light is actually influencing a space. If you see here, this is a room in daylight. And uh, during the evening, it would look like this. Now we have one light up, uh, which, is, which is on. Try to see how the space is opening up as we turn on more and more lights. Paul Henningsen had this idea that you should not have, have only one light, but you, have, you, you should have several lights or light points so that it, you get the variation. Or look at this space. You have a light point here, you have a light point here, and now we get more and more light points. And as we get more and more light points, the space gets more and more cozy and nice to be in. So this was about my hero, Paul Henningsen. If you ever look into him, he was very important for our culture as well, uh, and a very inspiring person, I would say. 
So when I designed the Patera, I just like Paul Henningsen designed it from within and out. Instead of going from outside to within, I, I went from within to out. Always to try to get as much out of the light bulb as possible. And I used the same system as Paul Henningsen. In the beginning, it was all in the computer because the, the, the geometry is quite complicated. Um, and then you see this shape and you think, oh, how, how did I come up with, that, with this design? Well, I didn't. It was already here for, well, I don't know how long, but uh, I didn't make it. Um, and this one, the previous one, was also an image of gravity. What is gravity? Well, gravity is this power that is, or the glue that makes the horizontal and the vertical. Gravity is making the rhythm from day and night and day and night, or gravity together with the sun. It's also making the rhythm of summer and winter and summer and winter. And all these repetitive uh, things of our cycles would make you think that the shape of life is a circle. But it's not. Because whenever you come to the same point of the circle or the cycle, you are one cycle older. So the shape of life looks like this. So you get born, you get older and older and older, and then you die. This kind of geometries is something the Italian mathematician Leonardo Bonaccio, known as Fibonacci, he was studying a lot and he found these geometries all over in nature um, and this inspired artists like Johann Sebastian Bach in the music or, or Leonardo da, da Vinci they found this uh, it's called the golden, golden ratio or the Fibonacci sequences and I used it for the Patera so here you see some of the first computer models and this is then the production model what I'm in particular proud of with this lamp is that even though it is a circular spheric lamp, um, then uh, the light uh, distribution is not omnidirectional like with most uh, lamps. And the way you can see this is the light dis distribution. And the way how we achieved this was by using this uh, Paul Henningsen um, system where you always get the reflections but we open it up so when you're directly underneath you will see the light bulb and one might think that this is a very uh, fragile and delicate thing but actually it's quite sturdy um, and quite light so even though you have not the strongest uh, uh, ceiling you can you can uh, uh, you can hang it there. Um, yeah, and also, if something happens like this, then you can very easily pop it back in and it's, it works. So it's not because we are always hitting things, but we are Vikings and you never know what happens. Um, so this is the classic Patera. Um, how many of you have been in this situation? Oh, lots. Oh my god. Um, so this guy is glaring you in purpose. Um, glare is not about light. Glare is about the contrast between light and darkness. And if you want to avoid the glare, you need a soft transition from the light to the darkness. So glare is not about light, it's about the contrast. Um, just an example, here we have some cars in daylight and during the night. Even they have the lights on, you won't get glared during the day. But during the night you will get a headache. Because the contrast between daylight and car's lights and night light and the car's light is much uh, higher during the night than during the day. You can use this actively with these very tiny small light sources. They, the glare is so big that you will be seen during the night riding a bicycle. So sometimes glare is good, sometimes it's not good. 
but in the home you definitely don't want the glare. Uh, you can use different strategies to avoid the glare. You can do like this as a hand or you can do as I did for centuries or decades. Instead of only having one light source, you use several light sources because then the contrast between the darkness and the light is less strong, even though the light might be stronger. So this is one light source which is more glary than several light sources. Today you can do this, oh, yeah, yeah, and this was used in this old chandelier. Maybe they didn't know what they did, but they succeeded. Maybe they knew it, I don't know it, but it works quite well. Um, and this was what I wanted to do when I made the Patera silver, which actually, this is the lamp you see here, was the very first Patera. But at that time, we didn't have the material for it. This was the very first prototype. I used five days to assemble it. <coughs> Today, and you, uh, how, how, how long time do you think it takes to create a car, a Renault? How many hours do you think it is? Well, it's 42 minutes. So to make a lamp that takes five days is just impossible. But we managed to get down the assembly time. Some very dedicated and good engineers in Louis Paulsen. So now it can actually be hand assembled in Denmark and still be a commercial product. So these were some of the first material experiences, which are very glary and uh, party, party, party. Um, and we wanted to make something more classic, uh, more timeless, but it was not on the market. So um, there were some people, they were looking and looking and looking, and now several years after the first white version is on the market, they found this material. So now you can actually have your own modern kind of chandelier uh, patera, um, which is like the classic chandelier, but in a more timeless sun-like shape. So with these words, ah yeah, I just have to say, give a small note too, uh, while the classic patera is this very calm uh, light, then the uh, patera silver has this more kind of sparkling light. Try to look at this. This is a forest. And you see this very light, direct sunlight. And then you have the contrast to the completely dark spots or the filter light. And the variation of these different kind of lights makes you, stimulates you. And when you go in the forest, you, you really get uh, um, stimulated. Or if you look at this image of the, of the shadows, try to see the, the different kind of shadows. Some are, have high contrast, some are moving fast, some slow, and you get this impression of it's a three-dimensional thing. Um, or here, you again see the, 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 the sparkling effect of, of the light in the forest. And this is a little bit the, the effect and the light you get of the Patera Silver. It's still glare-free because instead of having only one light point, it's getting fragmented to uh, several. You never see the light source directly, uh, so you have some really good functional light down here, while you still have this kind of sparkling atmosphere. And, 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 and hopefully you can somehow recognize the inspiration, which is the sun. With these words, I would say thank you very much. <laughs>